We've heard the Greensill scandal described as evidence of cronyism or sleaze in politics. If this was happening anywhere else in the world, we would have a word for it. Corruption. The lunches, the hospitality, the quiet word in the ear, the ex-ministers and ex-advisors for hire, helping big businesses find the right way to get its way. Greensill Capital was an organisation which provided something called supply chain financing. As the word financing suggests, this was a financial organisation. But because it wasn't a bank, it was able to escape regulatory oversight. And what that meant was that it kept providing more and more and more and more financing to an unsustainable level without anyone telling it to stop. And that's ultimately why Greensill was a house of cards waiting to collapse. And when it collapsed, a lot of interesting arrangements that it had made with senior politicians, with business leaders around the world came to light, which might explain why this firm wasn't regulated in the way that it should have been. Lex Greensill basically had a whole number of politicians all over the world, effectively, in his pocket. Lex Greenhill, Lex, where are you? Give us a wave. Thank you very much. David Cameron, the architect of austerity, linked to at least 120,000 deaths, along with an increase in inequality in our economy and the kind of erosion of trust in our democracy, didn't leave office to go and try and fix any of those problems. He went to increase his own power and wealth. This man has done more to divide To understand what David Cameron is accused of having done and the scandal that has grown up around his actions with regards to Greensill, we need to put that in the context of the global pandemic. Governments all around the world are now providing a great deal of money to private businesses to keep them afloat. And the Bank of England has a fund through which it purchases the debt of large companies in order to make sure that those companies can meet their short to medium term obligations to their creditors. Now, what David Cameron did was try to lobby the government to ensure that Greensill was included in the Bank of England scheme to allow them to get over these kind of short term financing difficulties. He also, along with Lex Greensill, lobbied the Bank of England itself, a supposedly independent technocratic body entirely above politics. Now, the issue there is that Greensill wasn't just facing short-term financing difficulties because of the pandemic. Greensill was fundamentally a completely unsustainable and ultimately insolvent company that should never have been receiving state support and that probably should never really have existed, or if it did, at least should have been properly regulated. So Cameron's lobbying really comes down to the position that he held at Greensill as an advisor. And the reason that he got that position is because he made Lex Greensill, the the eponymous founder of Greensill Capital, an advisor to his government back when he was in charge of the country. And in that sense, speaks to a much bigger problem of politicians and business people being in each other's pockets. Rishi Sunak has also been implicated in this story. David Cameron was firing off texts at all hours of the day to Rishi Sunak, asking him to include Greensill Capital in the Bank of England's scheme to support big businesses through financing difficulties that they may have had during the pandemic. Sunak did push for Greensill Capital to be included in these schemes, as did actually a number of different political leaders. Greensill did not receive that funding from the Bank of England. But the fact that all of these politicians pushed so hard for Greensill to get this money just shows how easy it must be for these big businesses to just knock on politicians doors and say look i need a favor it has also emerged that matt hancock had been pushing after several meetings with lex greensill in which david cameron was also involved in setting up for various different nhs trusts to adopt a greensill app and this app effectively did for workers what Greensill was doing for businesses. It allowed them to be paid before they'd actually been paid. Why is the British state bringing in this basically quite dodgy looking organization to provide this financing for people who should really not be in a situation where they're forced to draw down their salaries early because they should be paid enough that that isn't an issue. And the reason that this has become so important is because NHS 
staff haven't had enough of a pay rise during a pandemic in which they are literally putting their lives on the line. So there's an issue here which is about corruption and cronyism, which is David Cameron set up a meeting between Lex Greensill and Matt Hancock to get the NHS to adopt this piece of technology that Greensill has developed. But there's also a lot of other systemic questions here. This story is not just about a couple of bad individuals. It's about a completely and utterly rotten structure. This indicates a deep sickness at the heart of our politics, at the heart of our democracy. It shows that there are a couple of people at the top who can get away with anything, whilst working people are the ones that are left to pay for the consequences of their excesses. We saw it in the financial crisis, we're seeing it with COVID-19, and we're seeing it with this scandal as well. So this isn't just a few bad apples. This is a systemic problem. And every time a scandal like this emerges, we see more and more evidence of the revolving door between politics and the private sector. Whether it's Tony Blair, Theresa May, David Cameron, all of our former leaders can go into very well remunerated positions and retain a lot of power after they've left politics for good. It's less about having that extra million or 10 million pounds or dollars. And it's more about your power and influence. What's at stake is your standing in the global billionaire class. You're standing in the global political class. And what a lot of former politicians want to do is ensure that they continue to be relevant, is ensure that they continue to be respected and to retain that position within the global elite. And I really do think that that is why a lot of our former politicians end up going into these kind of business arrangements. It's all about seeming like you're the top dog, the guy that everyone comes to. It plays into that macho, patriarchal need to be the one who's in charge. Now, you might think that many of these businesses want to hire people like David Cameron or Theresa May because they are very good at what they do. That isn't really the case. It's not just people who you might consider to be very competent who have gone on to get these jobs in the private sector. Nick Clegg, for example, went on to get a quite senior role at Facebook. And if you look at all the MPs who were associated with Change UK, one of them's gone on to join the Bailiffs Association, another one's gone on to join a water company. They've gone into roles in the private sector, even though their political careers were examples of spectacular failures. Now, why are these private organizations hiring people to do jobs that, you know, they probably don't really have the requisite skills for? It's because they can provide contacts. It's because they can provide access. This is why Lex Greensill hired David Cameron in the first place, because he knew that David Cameron had Rishi Sunak's phone number. And if Greensill Capital ever got into any trouble, David Cameron would be able to text the Chancellor of the Exchequer to say, can you give us support? That's really what this revolving door is all about. It's about cash for access, effectively. It's an issue that frankly crosses party lines and has tainted our politics for too long. It's an issue that exposes the far too cozy relationship between politics, government, business, and money. This is fundamentally a question of democracy and accountability. We're told that we live in a system in which we all have a vote, in which we all have a say, in which we can enter into an economy, in which we are all individually free and equal and can exchange with one another on fair terms. What this story shows is that actually every single system in which we are involved is to a substantial extent controlled by a small number of people at the very top of our society. And increasingly, those people are insulated from democratic accountability. Lex Greensill is a private individual who had a huge amount of power over our political system. Nobody voted for him. David Cameron, people had voted for him, but he was no longer in office and he was still able to use his power to change the way our society, our economy, our political institutions work. So many of the decisions that affect our lives have been taken out of our hands. That's, I think, why there's so much disillusionment in this country. That's, I think, why people sense this need to take back control. It's because control has been taken away from people. The challenge that we really face now is taking back power and putting real power in working people's hands. That means we have to organize. It means we have to organize in our workplaces. It means we have to organize in our communities. And it means organizing at the national level to make sure that our politicians can't get away with this stuff anymore. 
This story, like so many others that Double Down News has covered, is about holding the powerful to account. That's why it's so important that we support Double Down News so that it can continue to do this incredibly important work and to make sure that there is accountability in our democracy. Join the future of journalism. Join Double Down News on Patreon.